So Enscape is a really interesting software. And I'll show you how you can access this uh, if you haven't already, if you're watching this video back. Um, so essentially, all you need to do is just go to Enscape3D.com and just search for their educational licensing. Uh, and from here, you can choose Get My Edu License. I'm going to turn my video off. <clears throat> you can choose to Get My Edu License. You just scroll down. You can choose Student. And essentially what happens uh, when you go through this, you need a photo of your ID card. Um, it should be able to detect that you're a student uh, just purely by your academic email address. And then the ID card is just for extra validation. For me, for some reason, it didn't recognize my email address. So my one's actually still validating now. He's actually double check in a minute to see if my license came through. Um, but while you're waiting for that, you can always go to the main homepage, get my free trial, and you get a free trial for 14 days until your license comes through. So plenty of ways to access it. But essentially, what is Enscape? <clears throat> so Enscape is a real-time visualization engine. Uh, and it's actually a plugin that works well with your other software. So it's not a standalone package like Twinmotion or uh, Lumion. It's something that's uh, going to be built into each of these packages. So for instance, uh, for me, I'm going to be using Rhino today. and I can install the plugin directly for Rhino. But if you're going to be using SketchUp or Revit, ArchiCAD or Vectorworks, it's the exact same set of tools, same tool palette, same settings. Um, so I'll talk about some of the differences as we go. Um, but just something to bear in mind. It's always going to be the same. So even though I'm using Rhino, you'll still be able to easily follow along with SketchUp. So that's that. Um, another thing worth mentioning, I think it's under the YNscape. No, it's not this tab. It might have been on the free trial, actually. There's a bit where you can download, ah, oh, showcase. There's a bit where you can download um, free sample projects. No, it's not free. It's not that one. I mean, even just from the showcase, you can see uh, the kind of quality that you get from these renders. They're pretty fantastic. You know, for, for a free rendering engine, that is absolutely brilliant. It has a mixture of styles as well. You can do like your typical clay renders or white renders. You can do some quite realistic stuff. You can do something a bit more conceptual. You can do camera effects like depth of field. Some really, really nice stuff to it. I'm wondering where I downloaded those sample files. Might have been on the free trial, but I think it might have been after this page once I signed up for a free trial. It's a bit of a shame. Yeah. OK, well, I downloaded some files directly from their website. Ah, it might be their uh, resources. I think, yeah, there we go. It was resources, sample projects. So if you don't have a 3D model to test with today, um, you can download a 3D model in your native software of choice. So you can just click on where it says resources and go to sample projects. Uh, and now you can download any of these. So for instance, if you're using Revit, you could choose to download a Revit file. Um, in fact, all of these ones are Revit. Oh, here we go. SketchUp files. You can choose to download SketchUp. You could choose to download an ArchiCAD one, a Rhino one. I'm going to be using this one today, this Enscape sample project just here. Um, so it's a nice, easy one to use. And you see there's a few different ones that you can choose. You can choose the native file format for each software. So for Rhino, that's 3DM. Or you can choose a standalone EXE. And I'll show you what a standalone EXE is. But if you want to play around with this in the actual software, it's the actual file type one that you want. So in my case, 3DM. But if you're SketchUp, it'd be SKP. So once you've uh, downloaded and installed that, and hopefully installed your license, you'll then be able to open up your project. So if you give me one moment, I'm going to go ahead and open my project. We'll let that load up. As always, I've got too many screens. I'm just going to rearrange this a bit. There we go. And let me just disable this because that won't be there when you first open it.
There we go. <clears throat> right, so for me, I've opened mine in Rhino. And again, it's up to you uh, which software you're opening it in. But I wanted to show it in Rhino in particular, just because a lot of people don't know where to find the uh, rendering tools once they've installed Enscape. So let's say I've um, already got a preset up scene here, but let's say I've already set up Enscape and I now want to be able to get to that rendering engine. The best way to access that in Rhino would be to right click anywhere around here, uh, just on the, the, uh, the taskbars. Go to show taskbar or show toolbar. And if you scroll right down, you'll be able to get down to Enscape. And you see, we've got quite a few different languages that we can choose from. So if English isn't your native language, feel free to go ahead and choose um, your native language if you see it listed. So I'm going to choose Enscape. And what that will do, that will just bring up this kind of floating panel. Uh, and if you don't want to have this panel floating like it is now, you can just drag it. Drag it up to where you have these other tabs and you'll be able to dock those tools just up there. So you see now I've docked this Enscape one and clicked on it. Now you can see I've got my Enscape tools ready to use. So it's really easy to set up. Um, if you're using SketchUp, again, super easy with SketchUp. Um, you just make sure it's enabled in your plugin manager, uh, your extension manager, and you then see it listed under extensions. So again, it's the same kind of principle. Uh, I believe the, all the other software like Archicad, Vectorworks and Revit, I believe they just appear straight away as toolbars, if I remember right. So it's only these two that you have issues with. But essentially what I want to do, I want to be able to open this up in the renderer and to be able to actually have a look around and walk around and navigate this space. So before we get into the intricacies of lighting and materials and stuff, uh, all we're going to do, we're just going to click on this orange button over here on our Enscape toolbar that says start Enscape in a separate window. If you haven't entered your license key yet, you can either choose uh, to continue with your evaluation, or if you've just received the license key, you can enter it in this box. Or if you want to buy it, which I don't recommend while you're a student because you get it for free, then you could choose to purchase it there. But I'm going to choose to continue that evaluation. So my one's starting up. I can see on one of my other screens, one of my other monitors, that a window has just popped up. It's just popped up like this. So that's loading. It's nearly done. Just make sure there's no other pop up windows. Nope. So I would say, depending on your hardware, depending on uh, how powerful your graphics card is in particular, and potentially how much RAM you have will determine how well and how smooth this is going to run. So the computer I'm using today, um, it's got a relatively decent graphics card. It's no, by, by no means super powerful. It's not very recent, but it's reasonably um, kind of good to use. But essentially, uh, the first time you open it up, you should see something like this. Um, as you'll see, I have the word trial version at the bottom because Enscape haven't sent me my educational license yet, even though I requested it a week ago. Um, so I'm having to put up with this. Hopefully you won't have that. But I'll say navigation is actually really, really easily. And the first time you open it, you should have this help panel down the right. But you can uh, hide and show this either by hitting the H key, so H for help, or you can toggle it by clicking on the little question mark up in the top right corner. I would say this is extremely useful, at least while you're getting started, um, because it gives you an idea of how to navigate. And it is primarily set up for right-handed people. So if you're a bit of a gamer, you will instantly understand these controls. So for instance, the W, A, S, and D keys are your forwards, backwards, left, and right. So that's quite straightforward. Um, my left mouse button allows me to look around. So it's like I'm standing in place, rotating my head around. My right mouse button allows me to orbit around things. Now, I just want to talk about that for a second before we go too much deeper in the controls. Now, depending on what you right click on determines what you orbit around. And a lot of people don't seem to realize this. So for instance, if I right click and hold on this guy's head, move my mouse around, it's going to be orbiting around his head. 
And likewise, if I were to now do it on this lady, I'm now going to be orbiting around her. So it's actually a really intuitive way to navigate once you get used to it and once you figure that out. Um, but to begin with, a lot of people just don't realize what that's doing. So they'll end up doing stuff like this, like, oh, I'm trying to rotate this. Like, why isn't it moving properly? So again, something just to kind of consider. You can, of course, use your scroll wheel to walk around, but I would say it's easier to use your W, A, S and D keys. Um, another thing that's useful is you can teleport. So for instance, if I wanted to jump over to this counter over there, I could double click on the people that are there and it will jump to that area. So that's also another fast way to navigate. So if I want to jump back to this person, double click, and that allows me to zoom straight to that area. So again, kind of straightforward, but it's only straightforward if you've got this help panel up on the side while you're getting started with it. Once you know the controls, you're absolutely fine. Um, it is worth mentioning that you can also fly up and down. So we know about the W, A, S, and D keys moving forwards, back, left, and right. If I push the Q key, you see I'll go down. If I push the E key, I'll raise up into the sky. So it will only work this way while you're on fly mode, because um, it means that you can just fly around. And you'll see that we can toggle between walk and fly by hitting the space bar. So if I were to hit the space bar now, it's going to apply some physics. And you see that I've just bounced down to the ground. I'm now at the same level as everyone else. And now I can walk around. And if I look up into the sky and press forward, I'm not going to walk up into the sky. So this can be really useful, especially if you're showing it to like a client or a tutor or someone, uh, just so they can kind of get an understanding of how to navigate that space. But if I walk up, in fact, I'm going to do this a bit faster. I'll show you how to do it faster in a sec. If I were to walk up where these stairs are, for instance, it will actually bump up the stairs. So almost like you're taking a step up each one. So again, it's, it's going to apply some basic physics to it. And likewise, if I fall off this little section here, because it's been badly modeled, just walked off there. There's no step leading back up. I can't jump up that. So there's no jump button. So if I wanted to escape out of this, I'd have to hit the space bar again to toggle into fly mode, hit forward and look into the sky. And now I've got over that bump. I could hit space bar again if I wanted physics back on. Um, one thing that people do tend to hate with Enscape is how slow it is to walk around. So this is me walking around at the moment, relatively slow. Um, I would say it's actually useful to be able to move that slow, especially when you're finally setting up your cameras. So again, it is another thing to consider. Um, but if you want to move a bit faster, I would say while you're holding forwards, you can either hold the shift key to walk a bit fast, or if you hold the control key, you walk even faster. So it's a really fast way to navigate around the scenes. As you can kind of see. Might make you feel a bit motion sick after a while. So I'm going to stop doing that for a little bit. So I think that's pretty much most of the basic tools, uh, basic controls at least. The only other thing I just want to show you as well, just while we're talking about the basics, uh, is changing the time of day. So this one's really easily, uh, really easy as you can see on the right. I can change the time of day by holding the shift key, holding my right mouse button and moving my mouse left to right. That is firstly pretty awesome that we can do this. Um, and I would say there's there's other things we can do with this. We can get finer control over the sun. Um, but I think already, you know, that is that is pretty impressive. So I can really raise that up. Sunrise in Enscape, I thought, has never really worked too well, to be honest. I'm not a huge fan. Unless it's something like this, where it's like a nice sunset or something. I think that works quite well. I absolutely love the procedurally uh, generated clouds in this. Yep, just holding shift, holding right mouse button. You see, as I drag this around down here, down in the bottom right of the viewport, you'll see what time of day we're changing to. So again, it can be extremely useful. So I'm going to move straight on to the next bit. Uh, we already looked at moving fast and moving faster. 
the next bit would be to um, have a look at some of the standard views. And this is extremely useful. So you can see here uh, the keyboard shortcuts for this. If I hit five to go into the middle, I hit five, you see it brings me straight into top view. And if I hit two, it's going to bring me to the front of the building. If I hit eight, it's going to bring me to the back. Four is going to bring me to the left side. Six is going to bring me to the right side. So again, in terms of navigation uh, and quickly navigating to external views, this is really, really nice, especially if I want to do like a quick rendered elevation or something like that. But one thing to bear in mind with this is even though it's put us into these views, they're currently not set to orthographic. So it might, it might look a bit orthographic. If I zoom in, you see we're clearly not. You know, we've still got perspective distortion. So it, currently this is set up as like a one point perspective with vanishing points somewhere around here, I think. Um, actually a little bit lower, like there-ish. Um, what was I about to say? Ah, yes, orthographic. Um, so yeah, you can toggle between these different modes. Um, you see it just up here. So you've got this little cube up in the top right. Currently we're on perspective. Um, if I wanted to do a two point perspective, again, I could do that. Uh, I'll tell you why we can do that in a minute. But if you want to do an orthographic, I'm just going to click the orthographic mode. You see it takes away all perspective distortion. And now I'm able to render out my elevation, just like you would on like a technical drawing. And the amazing thing is, is things like time of day still affect these. So same controls as before, shift and right mouse button. I can start to control how the shadows work over it. So again, it's pretty fantastic stuff. I'm actually going to put this back into perspective. Um, so let's bring it down here. So I'm sure you all know the principles of perspective. So 1.2.3 point, point, point at least. Uh, but essentially, when it comes to architectural visualization, one of the key issues I see all the time, even with final year students, uh, is that people haven't adjusted their verticals. So for instance, something like this over here on the, uh, on the left. And typically this happens because of the way they've set up the camera. So if you imagine as you're walking around the space, typically you're going to be walking along standing up, right? You're not going to be sitting down or something, uh, unless you're in a wheelchair, of course, in which case, yeah, the camera would be a bit lower. Uh, but if you're standing up and walking around, then it is something to consider. You know, you need to bring your camera up to eye level. So that would be where I would start first. And the great thing with Enscape is, of course, you can just hit the space bar to go into walk mode. And we know that that is set to be about the same height as a human's head. If I come and stand next to this person, you know, you see we're roughly the same kind of height. Uh, just coming back to that issue with verticals again, let's say if I'm looking forward like this, currently it's difficult to tell if I'm aiming my camera up or down or straight forward. And typically we want to aim for having it level most of the time. But if you look at any decent magazine for architecture or any architectural photography, 99% uh, of the time you're going to have perfectly straight vertical lines in the scene. So toggling this to two point perspective would just help to force that. So it means it just means you get a little bit more play with the camera angle. So it doesn't matter if I am aiming slightly higher or slightly lower. You know, I can play around a bit more with my composition. But it's always going to adjust my vertical tilt. So again, something useful. I would recommend, however, that you turn that off when you do fly through animations. Put it into standard perspective mode for animations. And we will do an animation today as well. Right, I think that's most of it. I am going to be coming back and toggling some of these settings uh, in a little bit. Oh, you know what? Let's do them now. Let's get this section done. I'm going to just go back outside for a minute. Oh. Let's have a look over here. I'm going to have a look at my sun again. So just while we're kind of setting up the environment a bit. Uh, we already know that we could adjust time of day by holding shift and right mouse button dragging it left and right. But what if we wanted to do a bit more fine adjustment? Well, luckily we can do that as well. So we know that we could also change the time of day by pressing U and I. You see it does exactly the same thing. 
as when I was holding the shift button and dragging the mouse. So this one's with the shift and mouse. This one's with you and I. It's exactly the same thing. But you see underneath time of day where we've got solar angle and solar rotation, I find these extremely useful. And for me, I would always uh, work with the rotation first. So to do that, I'm going to hold the control button. I'm going to press U and I independently. And you see what that's doing. It's keeping the height of the sun fixed. but It's allowing me to adjust the rotation. So for instance, if I wanted it peeking out, I'm going to try and get it to appear just between these leaves here. I could press the U and I keys. When I get closer, I can just lightly tap it. Oh, I'm not quite going to get it to where I want it to be. Yes. So I now know it's about there. And if I were to adjust the height, I could hold shift and tap the U and I keys. There we go. So it allows you to raise and lower it as well as rotate it. So it gives you full control over your uh, exterior lighting in the scene. There are a few more things we can change in terms of this. Uh, but again, we're going to be toggling those a little bit later. So don't worry about them just yet. Or I'll show you how to add in fog and, fog and stuff, make it a bit more, uh, a bit more atmospheric. Um, there's also the context menu. So that one's just right click. If you right click, you can choose to create issues and uh, you can show BIM data. Uh, these are particularly useful if you're using something like Revit, like if you're using a, a dedicated software that can do BIM, um, because that way I could right click, I could show the BIM data for something. So it could tell me the information for potentially how much it costs, what materials it's made from, what particular service or function that uh, a particular thing might have. So that can be uh, really, really useful. But one thing you can choose to do in this is to create an issue. So I actually really like this function. So let's say you're working on a collaborative project. Um, let's say you've just spent five hours working on a scene, you're texturing it up. Um, and let's say you're going to hand it to one of your classmates. Maybe you're working on a group project um, and they're going to be going through and adding their bit to it or something. What you could do is you could select an object or right click an object. And you could choose to create an issue. And what that will do, it will basically put a little marker over the thing that you've right clicked on. Um, and you could uh, basically just write what a problem is. And then the next person that changes uh, your file they would see that issue and say, ah, OK, this person wants this thing changed. Uh, I'll quickly do that for them. Um, or it could even just be a mental note for you. You know, it might be that as you're walking around, you've noticed something that's not right. It's been able to right click and quickly create an issue just for you to solve later. It's really, really useful. And these toggles won't come up when you render or animate. It's purely just there for while you're setting files up. So for instance, um, I think this guy is a little bit creepy the way he's staring at this lady. So I'm going to call this uh, creepy guy. Uh, and then a description of the issue. Staring at lady. So I can click on create. And now that's given me my little um, issue section over here on the left. And I could just um, modify each of these basically. So I could have as many issues as I need. So for instance, maybe this column's ruining a view. Maybe I need to rethink a structure or something. Maybe the texture's not, uh, not right on it. So again, I could create another issue. I'm just going to scribble in there for a minute. But the cool thing with this is you can click on each one of these issues, and it's going to be able to uh, zoom straight to it. It saves you having to hunt around. I'm just going to click back, click on that structure. So again, it's really, really useful. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, oh, that looks like a really good way to quickly save views. I promise you there's a much, much nicer way to save views. This is purely for uh, resolving issues uh, with files. So I just canceled out of that because I don't want to work on those issues just yet. Um, and you see now that we are kind of looking into these tabs up the top. So currently we're in home mode, uh, which apparently you can press escape to get to. I'm wondering if that's what this reset sun is down here on the bottom right, because it does say there's a button for home. I don't have a home button on my keyboard. I'm not sure what they mean by this. 
Um, and I've pushed just about every, every button on my keyboard and nothing has reset the sun. So I think that's something that Enscape needs to look into. I have no idea what the home button is. Um, but yeah, now that we're look, uh, looking at the section up here, we know that we can do the collaborative annotation where we can notify of any problems. If I were working on a BIM model, like in uh, Revit or Vectorworks or Archicad, then I would get the BIM information of stuff that's here. But Rhino doesn't natively support BIM, neither does SketchUp. And then we get onto view management. So view management is the little glasses icon. And you see there in this uh, sample scene that I've downloaded from the Enscape website, we've got a ton of example ones here. So there's an exterior view. There is a foyer view. And you can see just how useful it is to have each of these cameras set up already. So it's kind of nice. Because for me, I would say that there's nothing wrong, nothing worse than kind of setting up a camera, rendering it out. And then when you get to Photoshop, you realize you forgot to turn some geometry on or the lighting's not right. And you want to re-render that same image out, but you can't quite set up the uh, camera to the same angle. It's nothing worse than losing a good camera. Um, so again, I would recommend that you do set up your, uh, your cameras and make sure you save them under view management. And notice when I hover over these as well, it does give us the keyboard shortcut. So for instance, I'm hovering over these glasses in the top left. It tells me it's called view management. In brackets, it says F. So if I toggle the F button on my keyboard, it's going to open and close that. Why it's not V for view, I don't know, or C for camera. Um, it's just F. <laughs> but let's say I've walked around. Um, let's say... Let's say I wanted to capture this guy in my foreground a bit. It's a bit too much in my foreground, but maybe I want something that's in like uh, mid ground, fore foreground, mid ground, and background. I could frame my image, click on create view, and I could again call this guy creepy guy. He's not actually that creepy. I, I feel bad calling him uh, creepy guy. Um, if you've got any visual presets, which we'll look at setting up later, uh, you could assign those there. So for instance, I could set up a preset to do this as a clay render. I could do a preset that has it as a uh, material render, where you've got all the lights and textures and shadows and stuff. So again, you could tell it to render out in different views. But once you're happy with your composition, click on Create. And you see now it's added that view to your list of views. It's going to sort these alphabetically. So just something to bear in mind. It's also extremely useful to do this because if you wanted to render these overnight, essentially you could walk around, set up a bunch of cameras, like you could set up 100 cameras if you wanted to. Uh, as long as you're saving each of those views, you could tell them to render all out at once. Uh, and it will do them as one big batch render. And you could just pick them up in the morning, basically. They'd all save into a separate folder. So again, that can be really useful. Um, ah, yes, the asset library. I'm going to find a bit more of an open space for this. Something like this should be fine. Um, so the next bit is the asset library, and this is where it starts getting interesting. So it's this one that looks a bit like, kind of like curtains or something at the top. I'm not sure what that icon is actually supposed to be. But essentially what the asset library is, is it's um, Enscape's online library of objects. Um, and it's not just objects either, it's people as well. And you get things like trees, objects, uh, pieces of furniture. It saves you having to hunt for these things on places like SketchUp Warehouse. And the great thing with this is um, it allows you to bring stuff in with their proper materials. So for instance, if I wanted to bring in this computer, I could click on the computer, click to place it, uh, you do get some controls up here on the left, such as um, select, translate, which is move, rotate, and scale. So for instance, if I wanted to rotate this, I would click on the rotate button there, click on the asset. Now I can rotate that around. But if I wanted to make a giant computer, I could click on scale. I could pull these. I could scale it. Annoyingly, the undo button doesn't work there. Um, in fact, yeah, there's no undo button. OK, so I've broken the scale of that object already. But typically, they should all come in at one-to-one -one scale. 
So as long as you've modeled your entire object, uh, your entire model, I believe in millimeters, everything should come into one-to-one -one scale anyway. But once you click on apply changes, it's going to do some thinking and it's going to load in all the textures and everything. And as you can see, we've now got this Windows computer appeared. Now it'll even have like a slight sheen to the screen and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool stuff. It's a good way to get detail into your renders, uh, like very, very fast. There are a few different ways that we can use this. So I'm just going to have a look at people. Um, and you see at the moment, I could scroll through these Enscape assets and there's an entire insanely long list of stuff that I could scroll through. Um, or I could look for custom assets, stuff that I'm uh, creating myself and defining. I could add to that library if I'm going to use it over and over. But if I were to search for like a tree, for instance, I'll just simply type in the word tree and it's going to show me all kinds of trees. Or I could type in vegetation if I wanted to go a bit more broader, if I wanted to get things like bushes and branches and stuff. And there's some really cool stuff with these. So I'll show you why we're going to use these ones. Essentially, I can just drag and drop this. Click on apply changes. There we go. You see now we've got this massive tree in this model. So this tree doesn't quite fit in the atrium, sadly. Um, it's something that I could then just come back and scale down. Um, I can't remember if you need to double click it. In fact, no, I think once you've clicked on Applied Changes, I don't think you can come back and edit it. Oh, no, you can. I think you can right click it. Um, it's either right click or double click, I think. Double click. OK, yeah, so if you double click the asset, you can come back and scale it again. So I can just click on the scale button on the left. Scale that down. You see it will scale it from the base point, in which case this is the bottom of the tree. Let's just scale that down, click Apply Changes. Now I've got my nice tree down there. And you'll see that uh, while I'm moving my camera around, if I click on my left mouse button and move my camera, you see the leaves and stuff are going to be moving around as well. So anything with motion, um, so for instance, things that are affected by forces like wind, uh, these will only be moving around while you're moving. So if you're doing an animation, it will move. If you're doing a still render, it's going to save your uh, GPU processing by not uh, moving this around. So again, something to consider. I just want to talk about adding uh, people. Let's say I wanted to add a man into this. There's a few ways that I could go about adding people. So firstly, I could choose a type of person. You could type in person, child, man, woman, whatever you need to type in to find people. Um, but I could just, same as before, click on a person, click on place. I can choose to click on rotate on the left. I can choose to rotate these people around, which is kind of cool. So maybe he's going to be walking up to this counter. You know, he's just coming in from outside. He's going to be approaching this counter to uh, drop off a parcel. I'm going to click apply changes. Give that a minute to load in the textures. And now I've got my person in the scene. It's quite a fast way to populate stuff. Um, and in fact, if I have a look at what's happening in the Rhino model. Oh, there we go. Just going to zoom to this guy. So if I come back to my main Rhino model, you'll see that it's now added in that person holding the box. And this is why Enscape's so fast. It uses some very clever texturing techniques. So it's actually a very low polygonal model, um, but just with high quality textures. It does like a series of displacements um, over a decimated mesh to create these really, really fast, but really nice clean looking uh, visuals. So again, super blocky mesh, but very detailed person. Just very, very clever texturing. Um, now I do just want to show you another way that you can work with the asset library. Um, and this one is one that I think is extremely useful. So over here on the left, you've got single asset placement, which is what we've already been doing. We've been dragging in objects one at a time. If I click on multi-asset placement, I could choose to drag in multiple objects. 
So let's say um, I've got these little miniature sculpture people. Uh, I could click on the little uh, tick box in the corner of their windows. You see what's happening as I'm doing this? It's going to drag them in down the bottom. Um, I could choose a type. So I'm going to do a rectangular selection. So I'm just going to click there. You kind of get a feel for how this works. I actually don't really like it too much. Um, you can adjust the width a bit more. So I can adjust the width there, for instance. So this one, I'll, it'll move my mouse depending on where I place the cursor. And then the width I can adjust with this for kind of distribution. So I'm going to click to place that. And at the moment, it's placed a single uh, little statue in. If I play around with the density over here, it will auto populate that area. And the higher I increase that density, the more of these figures I'll have. So this is extremely useful. If you're doing like an exterior scene, uh, if you're doing like a woodland, for instance, I could just drag loads of trees into this area down there, select my entire area, drag the density high, and it would populate that with a mixture of trees. Um, and if you're not happy with how it's generated them, you can always just re-click on generate and it will reorient and rearrange them. And once you're happy, just click on confirm placement, apply the changes, and now it's added those uh, little figures in, which are really, really cute. Oh no, I don't want to add another one. Um, so I just hit the escape button. No. There we go. So yeah, always make sure you come back to that. Um, there we go, that's more like it. Yeah, so now we've got these really nice looking assets. And the assets in Enscape are so, so nice. You know, like, how nicely modeled is that? Such a simple model, but the textures are so on point. You know, the reflectiveness of things as well. And it can just help make your models just that bit more interesting, your visuals. As long as they relate to your scheme, of course, don't just chuck things in uh, to the sake of it. Not for the sake of it. That's just going to be uh, awful. Things should always relate back to your concept. Remove this person. There we go. Cool. Um, I think next what we'll do, we're going to move on to. Yeah, let's have a look at doing a screenshot. Oh, hang on. Why is this telling me to do changes? Discard all. Ah, because I deleted the person. Sorry, I, I wondered why it was saying apply changes. Yeah, so there's a few things that we could do. So let's say, for instance, um, I've set up a, a quick composition. In fact, before we talk too much about composition or cameras, um, I just want to mention this website to you. I know there's going to be a lot of first year students that might not be familiar with uh, this website. So this website in particular is extremely useful. This helped me many years ago when I was a, uh, a architecture student myself. Uh, it's called visualizingarchitecture.com. It's by a, uh, a guy called Alex Hogerfer. Now I have pronounced this guy's name as Alex Hogreef for about 10 years. And I only found out in an interview with him recently that his name is pronounced Alex Hogerfer. So I feel awful for pronouncing his name wrong for 10 years. Um, especially when I find out that he's put together these lovely tutorials over here on the right. So if I click on tutorials and go to all tutorials, he's very kindly assembled all of the fund fundamentals of architectural visualization. Uh, and the key one we're going to look at today is just composition. So if you look at composing an image, there's a lot of really useful things in this. So for instance, if you're completely new to visualization and if you've never explored photography before, it's good to learn about the basics. So things like uh, rule of thirds. So being able to um, frame specific key elements uh, on along the third lines, essentially. So it's all about drawing uh, the viewer's eye to specific points. So for instance, horizon line on this one is along the upper third, horizon line on this one above. Well, I can click on these to make them bigger. Horizon line on this one's on the lower third. Horizon line on this one is on the upper third because it's an aerial shot. Vertical lines are always nice and straight. Nice interior shot. 
So again, this one, um, we got the vanishing point appearing where these two thirds overlap. So it just helps to add kind of structure to it, it helps to frame your images. So try and bear in mind these principles while you're working. And you can turn on a grid in Enscape so you can see these third lines, it really helps for composition. Uh, toggle between one and two point perspective. Uh, you can talk about centering your views. Um, we don't want nature to dominate unless you're doing like a big um, landscape project or like urban infrastructure project. But yeah, I wanted just to show not about the verticals. We looked at verticals already. Yes, I wanted to um, just talk about getting people in. So I mentioned earlier about taking photos at eye level. Um, if you take photos too high, so for instance, like in this image just here, and this is common for people when they're first starting with architectural visualization. A lot of people will try to get as much of the scene as visible as possible by moving the camera really high. And you see it gives this really unnatural look because no one is this tall. You know, no one holds their camera really high above their head to take the photos, unless you're at like a concert or something. Uh, whereas if we were to go down to the next one, taking this at eye level gives a much more natural feel to it. Because now it's like you're actually in the uh, in the space itself. It's the same way that you'd be looking at it if you're actually in the scene taking a photo. Uh, and a good rule of thumb with this is if you've got your camera set to eye level, then that means your eye level is at the horizon line, which means everyone else that's standing up, no matter how close or far, will always be at the horizon line too. So it means if someone's in the distance, you know their head is around about the horizon line, then you're just scaling them until their feet touch the floor depending on where they are in the uh, in the scene. So it's a really useful thing just to be aware of. So coming back to this, um, I'm not going to be worrying about the intricacies of composition today. Um, instead, I'm just going to be kind of walking around until I find something kind of interesting. I think right now I'm kind of liking the look of this. And you'll see why in a minute why I've chosen to do this. Um, I'm not going to play with the video editor just yet. We're going to do that towards the end. You see the next button is the video editor up there. Um, but once I come out of that asset editor, you see I can now get access to my other tabs again. So the next one would be to create a screenshot. So I'm going to click on the screenshot button. Uh, it's going to ask me to cho choose a location to save. So I'm going to just make a folder and call this Enscape Renders. You can give it a name if you like. And I always prefer to save my renders as PNGs, uh, so portable network graphics. Um, I just think it's good to get into the practice of doing that. Uh, JPEGs are really good for kind of natural images. PNGs are much better for um, kind of computer generated images, just as a general rule of thumb. Um, and the reason I like PNGs as well is because if you have any transparency to your renders, it'll always be able to preserve transparency if you've enabled things like alpha channels. So I'm just going to click on save. That's now exporting my image. And once it stops coming up with any messages, I would then navigate to that folder. Um, drag that down there. Navigate to the folder. Open it up. And annoyingly, I've got multiple monitors. And you see it's just rendered that out. And of course, I've got this massive trial version bit appeared there because I don't have my educational license through just yet. But on your final render, you won't have any of this stuff appearing. I don't think they're watermarked, the educational version. Um, you might want to let me know if they are. So I'm just going to close that for a minute. Yeah, so being able to render out it's super, super easy. You know, you could just click on um, click on that screenshot and it will actually uh, render that thing out. Um, you do also have batch rendering just next to it. So you remember earlier I said about setting up those views. This is exactly what it's for. So for instance, I could render out the creepy guy that I set up. I could render out a few other ones. Let's just choose three images for now. Maybe I want one exterior, one interior where the stairs are, and my creepy guy. Uh, I can now just click on render images. Choose where to save them to. And now it's going to batch process multiple renders at a time. So again, pretty fantastic stuff. So if I were doing like a thousand renders for some reason, I can now go to sleep, let this render stuff out. Now, when I wake up in the morning, all my renders are done. 
So there we go. Not bad, bearing in mind how fast those just rendered, you know, these aren't bad. Um, and we haven't even set up things like the resolution and stuff like that yet. We've not even added any effects or anything like that. But, you know, just to quickly illustrate a project, I would I would be confident sharing these with clients. Uh, and that's pre Photoshop. You know, obviously you should always bring life to your visuals in Photoshop. Rendering is only ever half of the uh, the step for visualization because, you know, it's, it's a good way to kind of visualize our form and apply materials and simulate lighting and things. Uh, but it doesn't add uh, a sense of style. Style is what you'll always add in to your renders after in Photoshop. At least that's that's the way I've always approached it. Um, there is one more thing here, and it is panoramas. And I can click on the drop down to choose between mono and stereo panorama. And in fact, I'm going to click on mono. I'll show you what this does. So it's going to basically render out as a 360 image. So I'm going to let this calculate for a second just while I go and grab a drink. Um, but yeah, it's going to stand in the position that you're currently in. Um, it's going to rotate the camera around and it's going to be able to uh, render that out as a 360. Now, this doesn't save into your folder that you've already set up, uh, at least not by default. So I'm just going to render this out now and then I'll show you uh, how you can access this more towards the end when we get into the next section. So it's going to go grab a drink and I'll be back in two secs. There we go, I'm back again, just going to wait for that one to render out. <coughs> Nearly there. So this is why I wanted to show this one, just because as you can see, it does take a while to render. And once it finishes rendering, it just kind of disappears. And people generally get quite upset because they're like, oh, well, why did it render all of that stuff? And then it's it's not appeared. Um, so again, if I come back to my render folder, you'll see there's no panorama there. Um, I will show you where to access that shortly, but don't worry about it for now. Um, we haven't really looked too much at the section up here on the top right just yet. So one thing that's also kind of nice is the minimap. I could toggle the minimap. It will generate a very, very rough um, kind of floor plan up here in the top left. In fact, if I drag this a bit bigger, um, <coughs> just to kind of help you navigate. And you can zoom in and out of this as well. Um, so it's just a kind of nice interactive element. And this is also another way that you can navigate around. So I could click anywhere in this model on this floor plan. And it would take me to those areas, which is kind of or I could walk around manually and you see it will navigate that floor plan. So again, just another thing to mention can be kind of cute, especially if you're showing it to like a client. Um, you can also show the safe frame. So this is the area that will actually be in the render. A lot of people get frustrated when setting up their visuals because they'll think uh, the entire thing is going to be visible, the entire screen. But of course, your <coughs> your typical resolutions are going to be things like uh, standard screen sizes. So 1920 by 1080, uh, 4K, 1440p, any of those. Uh, and at the moment, obviously, our current view is full width, but it's cropped at the top and bottom because of the, uh, the viewport. So being able to toggle on the safe frame just allows you to accurately see what is going to be in the final render. I'm going to toggle that back off for now, though. We already looked at perspective, uh, including two point. And again, if I'm, 
let's, let's say I have set up something, something like that. You know, maybe I want to go for a nice low shot, but maybe I can see that my verticals aren't quite right. Again, quickly correcting to two point can just help to fix that. We know we can toggle between fly and walk mode. So again, really straightforward. We could just do that with spacebar though. Um, <coughs> final bits over here. We could enable a VR headset. So you need a, a relatively powerful graphics card for this. I believe they recommend RTX 2070 and above. I don't think it's RTX 2070 super. Uh, but long story short, you need a very powerful graphics card for this to run uh, nicely. I can run it on my current graphics card, which is a GTX 1080, but it's a bit rubbish. It comes out a bit jumpy. Um, you could lower the resolution, but then of course you're gonna get things like motion sickness. But essentially, if you've got a VR headset connected, you just click on that button and it will go straight to the VR headset. So you can jump in, walk around, navigate, do everything you need to do. Um, I probably will do a session on that uh, live on campus at some point. So for anyone watching this back, if you think, oh, I want to play with some VR in Enscape, uh, you know, drop me a message uh, and I'm happy to set up a session if there's enough interest. Do have uh, VR headsets on campus. Um, right, now we get into the next two bits. So we've got the visual settings and we have the renderer window settings. I'm going to show the renderer window settings first, just because this one's not as useful. Um, so currently I actually can't modify this because I'm on the trial version, but if you have a valid license, you'd be able to set up your own uh, logos and things. So for instance, if you're rendering out as part of your own company, maybe you have your own branding, you could swap out the Enscape logo and replace that with your own. Uh, particularly useful for when you're doing things like fly through animations and stuff. Um, you can also change your input. And one thing that people like to change with this, and I like to change, um, is the smoothing, the mouse smoothing. So by default here, the mouse smoothing is set to 1.5. I like to keep it on about 1.5 because I like my mouse to be quite sharp. Um, for some people, especially in presentation mode, mouse smoothing is put all the way up to like seven or something, which I find horrible. Because as I move my mouse, you know, I could stop my mouse now and you see it carries on moving. So I'll go stop. And that's what that does. It's kind of like a soft move. Some people love that. Some people hate it. Um, but again, it's worth knowing that you can toggle the strength of that. Just in case it's messing up the way you're setting up your files. But you can adjust your spectator height. Uh, so that's the height of your camera when you hit spacebar to go into walk mode. Um, you can adjust things like width. You can adjust different hotkeys. Uh, there's, there's so many different things you can do. If you're using a 3D space mouse, you can enable that as well. So you can use that for control. I don't have one of those connected today. Um, and you can also change between a 3D TV stereo mode. So if you're playing this into a 3D TV, uh, you can choose the mode that you want to uh, do it by. So you could do half width per eye or full width per eye. And apparently that will allow you to view it on a 3D TV. And this is essentially the exact same way it's going to work on the VR headset as well. So most VR headsets will have a left lens and a right lens. It's just going to be showing you those two separate views. And that's actually two separate cameras that are next to each other that are uh, the same distance as your eyes, basically, like width-wise. So just something that's worth knowing. Now, the final thing before we start playing with the more advanced stuff and setting up materials and things, uh, the final thing would be to have a look at the visual settings. So the visual settings is this box up here. Uh, it's this little eye icon with an arrow. And this is a very, very useful panel. This one is one that you're going to be using a lot to set up your scenes. I'm going to jump outside to begin with. So stupidly, I chose an interior model, even though a lot of this is going to be exterior based. Um, but essentially, we can choose between different modes. And if the mode is set to none, it's going to show all of the materials and textures and stuff. If I set it to white, it will do what we call a clay render, where it will still simulate lighting. You know, we can still see light and shadow. It's removed all color from the scene. And again, I think this is actually a really nice style. Uh, maybe you want to add in your own textures on top. It will still show you all the bump maps for the textures. 
Um, but, you know, it'll just remove all that color from the scene. So that could be really useful, especially if, if you're rendering out, um, oh, going the wrong direction. Hang on, there we go. Yeah, especially if I'm rendering out the same view multiple times. So let's say, for instance, I've got this view like this. I could render this out in white mode. Then I could also render it out in uh, like full color or none mode. And then I could composite these in Photoshop. And because they'll be rendered to the exact same size and from the exact same angle, I get full flexibility on how to blend these together. So again, something to consider. There are a few other modes you can play with. So like uh, polish tool mode um, and light view. So light view is actually a really useful tool. It will allow you to see if there's any clipping. Uh, so anything that's uh, red is going to be kind of clipping completely bright white, which means you might want to adjust things like your exposure. Um, I actually wouldn't adjust things too much. You know, I think the default settings are generally close enough for what you need. Uh, but it, it just tells you the intensity of the light, the level of brightness. So if you do see something reflecting too much, you might want to turn your brightness down a bit and it would help to uh, help to fix that. <clears throat> you can also turn outlines on. I don't know why anyone would ever want to turn the outlines on. Um, it makes it look very sketch up like. I personally don't like that. Um, I suppose it can be effective if you combine it with the white one, but it still doesn't really make it look like an illustration. So I, I'm, I'm really not a fan of having the lines added to that. Um, again, you can change the camera perspective if you want to quickly adjust it there. You can uh, disable auto exposure if you want to be able to adjust it yourself. I'm going to go straight back to auto. Now, interestingly, you can adjust things like your field of view. Uh, now, I'm going to come back down to where we have these little statues for this one. Um, who, who do I want to focus on? Yeah, I think it was this person I like the look of. Yeah, so let's say, ah, oh, no, I'll tell you what, we can't see enough of these people. Let's find another person. Way to get one where you can kind of see their face a little bit. Um, see what I'm going to do. I'm just going to rotate one of these people around a bit. Um, oh no, here we go. This guy will work. Let's raise that up and down a bit. Go forward. Yeah, looks like that's going to be pretty good. Yeah, so if I come back to that visual mode. Um, I can play around with things like field of view, which adjusts the uh, essentially the width of the lens uh, that can, we're going to be playing with, but make a note of the original. So that it's currently set to 90 degrees. If I were to set this, um, you know, to be much lower, maybe like 35 degrees, you get an idea of what that's doing. You know, it's, it's going to really crop that image down. Makes the whole image look uh, a lot more flatter. Whereas if I put that back up to 90, you just see how much more uh, perspective distortion we have, which is kind of nice. Now, I'm not too worried about playing with that. You know, it's something you can play with in your own time. But I did just want to quickly show you the depth of field. A lot of people don't understand how this works. Um, now, essentially, all you need to do is drag the depth of field slider. And you get an idea what this is doing. You know, you can see straight away it's blurring the image, it's adding a nice bokeh to it. Uh, but if I turn off autofocus, I can adjust the focal point with this slider. So I can drag this slider down. And I'm not going to be looking at the slider. I'm going to be looking at the scene. So for instance, if I wanted that eye in focus of this little statue, let's drag it until this white fluffy line is over that left eye or his right eye. And then to adjust the intensity of the blur, I would adjust the slider above. You know, and you can get some really nice kind of photorealistic effects with these. Um, it really does add that bit of extra depth to to the visuals. You know, looking at something like that, that's that's pretty fantastic that we can just do it that easily. Um, I probably want to enable my two point though, just to create that perspective distortion. So that's that. Now I'm actually going to turn that back off for now. Just going to uh, turn off my um, depth of field. 
Uh, you will see as well that we have rendering quality. So currently it is set to draft. Um, you can change this between medium and high as well, of course. Uh, and essentially all that's going to do, it's just going to change the way it calculates light and shadow. So if I put it down to draft, firstly, my computer is going to prefer working in draft because it doesn't need to process all the light and shadow. It's going to work much, much faster. But you see we lose a lot of that information that was there. If I set it to medium, again, you can kind of see what's going on with this. You know, it's, it's starting to show things like reflections, but it's not adding that depth. It's not adding a lot of the shadow information. As soon as I put it to high, now it's starting to look a bit more realistic. It's calculating all the properties that we're going to need. And there is an ultra mode. Um, and I think if you hover over these, it does tell you what they do. Uh, and all ultra does, it's very similar to high, but it does um, essentially more samples of the light bounces. So you means uh, you get more accurate lighting and reflections and shadows and stuff. Uh, if I go to the image drop down uh, or the image tab even, again, I can do some basic color correction, but I would say to be very, very careful here. Um, I think Enscape's default settings are actually fantastic. I think it's one of the better softwares for default settings. Uh, I think the way it does color balance is already pretty good. Um, same thing with contrast. You know, I think by default it does it pretty well. So try not to modify these too much. Um, you know, you could of course do some quick settings, uh, but I would say do most of your adjustments um, in Photoshop as post-processed. You might still want to do like um, some basic color adjustments. So for instance, we could uh, kind of shoot this in log. I could turn the saturation down a bit, get a bit more dynamic range in the end. Um, I could adjust things like color temperature. If you've got moving objects, like animated objects in the scene, you could add motion blur. But the one I want to draw your attention to is Bloom. So Bloom is one that students find usually quite early on. I'm just going to come up here for this one. Um, they'll find it quite early on, just while they're dragging things around, and they'll say, wow, it makes my lights glow. And it does. You know, I, I think it's important to show that your lights are on and actually emissive, you know, to be able to glow. But don't go over the top with Bloom. Nothing looks worse than having a, a super, super bloomy image. There's other ways that you can add atmosphere into it. So again, something just to consider. I personally prefer a bit of Bloom. Um, I, I like a bit of a glow and a bit of like an ethereal look to it. But again, it is something you need to kind of be careful of. Obviously, be careful with lens flares as well. I don't think I even need to talk to you about lens flares. Uh, adding vignettes again. Yeah, I could add it here if I wanted to. Uh, and it will create this really nice kind of dark to light gradient. But you're much better off not rendering with a vignette at all. And then adding that in in Photoshop. Because at least that way you got the raw render and then you can control the vignette manually yourself later if you wanted to. Whereas if you render it with the vignette already in, you can't remove it, or at least it's very difficult to remove. So again, something that's, uh, that's worth considering. And then you've got things like chromatic aberration as well. So things where essentially the further away they get, you might start seeing like separation of color or like slight haloing around objects. That's basically what this is going to do. Uh, it's going to adjust that. So some people really like chromatic aberration, some people don't. Um, but now we start getting into atmosphere. So again, I really am just going through all tabs today. I'm convinced I can get everything covered within the two hours. In fact, I think we would actually be a bit lower than that. Um, but if I come to atmosphere, you see I have fog. And fog is essentially the key thing that gives us atmosphere, uh, believe it or not. Even uh, on an interior, uh, if you increase your fog setting, that will essentially simulate things like dust and particles in the air. It just helps to add that little bit of atmosphere. But a good way to see what this is doing is if I adjust my um, my sun, which one was rotate? It's that one. If I adjust my sun, let's say for instance I have the sun shining there, for instance. At the moment, I can see the glare glowing between these. I can see that light is colliding with this tree but that light doesn't travel any further than a tree. If I were to increase the intensity of the fog, however, and if I increase the height of the fog, you see that it's going to start casting what we call God rays, 
or just light rays. So these kind of things. This is obviously way too foggy. I'm exaggerating this purely to show the principle, of course. Um, but it's a really nice way to get these light rays. So if you're doing like a dusty interior, for instance, like uh, maybe you're doing like a library with big windows and you want the light shining through and you want these rays coming through it, increasing the fog, even though it's an interior shot, would actually work really, really well. So again, just something to consider. So I'm going to lower that back down a bit. And you see, obviously, this is all to do with atmosphere, this section. So you do get to adjust things like uh, the sun brightness. You know, if I drag that out over there, that does look a bit overkill, that sun at the moment. So maybe I'm just going to bring that down a bit. I'm going to make a note of its current percentage. And you see, if I drag this down, it just makes the whole thing look kind of flat. I could, of course, bring it up massively to adjust that as well. Um, so it's just something that you need to kind of uh, explore. You just need to kind of play around with it. Um, I'm actually not a fan of how that's looking at the moment. So I'd probably be looking to change the time of day a bit and then just rotate that back into place. Um, which one was it? Was it that? Some, something like that. If I'm going for a sunrise, it'd be a bit better. Uh, anything like interior lighting? If I just walk forwards again. <clears throat> Area lighting pretty much all has the same value by default. Uh, and you can adjust the artificial light brightness in here. So I could increase that up to whatever percentage I want. Or I could turn it completely off and it would turn these lights off. Um, these ones, by the looks of it, are set up as emissive materials rather than actual lights. So if I had like light planes in my model, uh, I'd be able to control them with this slider there. But if you set up as glowing materials like these ones, it's not going to affect them. So something just to kind of consider. But even things like shadows, you know, if I come back to the outside again. Um, let's just adjust that time of day till we can see the shadows. Yeah, if we look at like the shadows casting on stuff, you know, in most renderers, there will be super sharp, shad super sharp shadows like that which obviously look really artificial, but being able to get that finer control over your shadows can be super, super useful. Now you can still add in that extra detail for things that are close and have it getting a bit blurry for things that are further. Wind is also an interesting one. So again, we're looking at atmosphere at the moment. You know that as I move around, you know, I can see the wind is kind of affecting this, affecting these trees. I can make this much more ex uh, exaggerated. So if I put the intensity all the way up, as I move around, you see it's now almost kind of storm-like in a way. If I went to blow in a specific angle, I can set the angle there, and it would now blow in a specific uh, specific direction. So again, something that can be useful if that's what you want to play with. Um, same thing with sky as well. You know, you can uh, really play around with sky. But essentially, it's not just the sky it changes. It's actually just the background in general. So one thing I love with Enscape in particular is it does enable you to have a white background. Um, and if you render this as a PNG, I believe it just sets that as transparent, which is fantastic. So it's already pre-cut out. I could be wrong with that because various versions, it is different. Um, but yeah, it's just really nice to not have to go around and cut things out. And you can see, especially if I'm rendering with trees, that's really, really nice. <laughs> you know, in Photoshop, like if it doesn't uh, cut this out for any reason, if I saved it as a JPEG or something, for instance, in Photoshop, I could just use the magic wand tool. Then I could just use the similar selection to select all of the other white bits, making sure nothing else that's white in my scene, like these lights, are getting selected. So I just cut them out. Um, but yeah, I can turn off the white background. I can now add in uh, different horizon objects. So for instance, I could just add in kind of white white cubes for kind of context. I could add in apparently an urban environment. Add in like a bit of a town in the background. So essentially, these are HDRI images, high dynamic range um, images, or just spherical images. And they're, they're not intended to give you a perfect horizon like that. But if I if I were rendering like this, you know, it's good to show stuff in the background. If I'm doing an interior shot, again, I'm not going to be seeing where my scene meets the uh, the surrounding context. 
So I'm not going to need to worry about that too much. But one thing I do like playing with in this is the, uh, the sky itself. So you can adjust the rotation of the environment. You can adjust your moon size if it's nighttime, but you get full control over your clouds. And I love playing with this. I could play with this all day. So you can adjust the density of the clouds themselves. And again, it's all procedurally uh, generated. And the more cloudy it is, the more that affects your light. So remember earlier I was saying about um, that slider not affecting the uh, sun too much by adjusting the brightness. I could control the sun's brightness just as you would do in real life with clouds. Because the sun's brightness never really does change in real life. It's one consi uh, consistent light source. The thing that changes is its elevation in the sky and the uh, level of cloud in front of it. You know, is that light being blocked? But yeah, you can adjust like the variety of the clouds. Uh, you can adjust the cirrus amount, which is kind of nice. So this kind of secondary clouding. You can adjust the contrails, which are things like um, what you get behind planes. If I increase this up a bit, it's actually quite hard to see like that. If I lower these down, you see the contrails. Where's the contrails? Oh, there we go. So it's these kind of plane lines in the sky. There we go. Could be useful if that's what you want. Uh, and of course, you can then just move it around just to kind of frame the clouds a bit better. So you can move it on there, you kind of U and V axis, then longitude and latitude. Final thing with this setting, uh, these, uh, this section, and we're very nearly done with the whole of Enscape now. We're, we're nearly finished with the software. Uh, the final thing is the output. So, so far, we've been rendering images out as tests, but we haven't set up any kind of resolution. And this is just a standard way to do it. So you can go to output where it says resolution. You see it's rendering to full HD uh, and full HD is just 1080p resolution. At least it should be. Um, you could choose ultra HD, which should do it to at least. Oh, I thought it was 4K. I'm now not sure. Yeah, it is 4K. So you can render it to 4K resolution, 1080p. Um, I believe standard HD, I think, is 720p. I'm not sure. Yes. In fact, yeah, when you click on them, it changes it there. So HD is 720p. Full HD is 1080p. Ultra HD is um, 4K. Or you can type in a custom resolution and do something different. I'm going to keep it on um, full HD for now. And again, you can change your file format. So you can set that as PNG. If you wanted transparency, yeah, you could export it with the object ID and depth. That could be really useful. Um, if you're rendering out a ton of images, you could enable automatic naming. So it'll automatically name your files. Uh, that's really, really, really yeah, useful. And same thing with video as well. I know we've not set up any animations yet, but we're going to do that in a few minutes. Um, this is really useful for adjusting your video in this section because you can set the number of frames per second or number of still images it needs to render per one second of video. Um, you know, you can choose quite a few of these, like a standard cinematic would be 25 frames per second or 24.95, whatever it is, 24.97. always forget which one it is, 997. Um, 30 frames per second is your kind of standard. It's what you see on YouTube quite a bit. 60 frames per second uh, is where you get much smoother motion. It's used for kind of like, um, um, like typically if you're going to slow things down to slow-mo, um, I wouldn't really bother with 60 frames per second these days. 120 frames per second you just don't need, realistically, not for architectural visualization. If you're into like competitive gaming and stuff, then yeah, 120 FPS, 240 FPS, etc., might be useful. But 30 frames per second is more than enough. Uh, same thing for panoramas as well. You can also adjust the resolution of your panoramas. I'm not going to play around with those. And that's that. That is essentially most of Enscape in a nutshell. The only thing we haven't tried setting up yet um, is an animation. Because we know how to frame images, we know how to render them out as still images. So that's dead easy to do. The only thing we haven't done, obviously we haven't set up materials and lights yet. I will show you how to add those in, at least for Rhino. 
Um, uh, but the only thing we haven't done is set up a, a video. So I'll show you now just how easy this is to animate. So I'm going to click on the video editor just up here or hit V for video. I could click to show the grid lines if I wanted to see that rule of thirds uh, that I was doing before. So again, it just helps you kind of frame your compositions that little bit easier. So especially because um, we're not going to be turning on two point perspective because we're going to be walking around the space. So this just it helps me to see that I'm uh, framing my image quite nicely. Um, I could turn the uh, grid lines back off after if I don't want to render them out. Um, I'm a big fan of keeping easy in, easy out on. And what this will do is it will give you soft movement when the camera starts moving and then soft movement when the camera stops moving. Um, you could also enable shaky camera if you want it to be a, a bit more human like. But again, you don't need to do that. But essentially, the, the way this works is the whole thing works on keyframes. So what we'll do, I can click this little plus button, uh, this little orange plus to start a keyframe. And what this does is it just sets like a starting point. I could then walk forward. In fact, you know what? I don't want to walk to there. Let's say I want to go underneath through this table. Actually, what I'd do, I'd set up my next frame, something like that. I would click the next plus. Maybe I want to frame this view, so I click the next plus. And then maybe I want it to flip back around and then frames like that. I click that final plus. So I can see the overall duration of this video is 14 seconds at the moment. If I go back to the beginning and push play, it's now going to preview that. It's, it's going to make sure it uh, moves the camera path so that it fits through each of those. And you see we already had one problem, which is why I wanted to do like a low shot. Um, you see that as I push play, everything goes well. But it's going to try and go under the ground because it's going to try and fit through this next keyframe. That one there to then get up to that one. It's essentially creating like a curve between them. So what I'd want to do is just move the camera to that point where it's about to go through the ground. No, there we go. I believe you can just adjust the slider as well, I think. Um, let's go to that next keyframe. Yeah, so we need to just add one in the middle, basically, because we know that at the moment it's going below that ground. So I'm messing this up just a little bit. I want to reposition that one. There we go. Yeah, so what, what bit is it failing at? So it's when it gets kind of to the green, I want it to stop. So I would bring it down. So in fact, you, if I move away, you'll see where this kind of is. That's probably a much nicer way of showing it, actually. If, if, if you go back to the beginning of your timeline and then just manually move the camera, you will see the camera path. This is actually a much nicer way to do it. Now think about it. And you see what that problem was, where we set those keyframes before. Yeah, we framed that view and then that next view. It's trying to connect these together. So to prevent something like this from happening, essentially, I just need to add in another camera and you can click on that. And you could then just add that as a keyframe. And then hopefully that might fix it. In fact, I think I did that as a keyframe wrongly. I think I've now set that as a, in fact, how is that even going to play? Or is that going to double back on itself? I think I needed to add it as a plus there rather than at the end. Yeah, so that still goes through the thing. So this is slightly different to, um, to the last time I did this. I want to just hit the delete button to delete that keyframe, which is this one selected. 
There we go. Yeah, so all I would do, I would click on that. I can see that it's between these, so I think that's where I would add that keyframe. So now I can zoom out a little bit. As you can see, it's starting to fix that issue. Yeah, that was slightly confusing that. Let's do another one. So for instance, I could add a keyframe there. I could raise the camera just a little bit. I can see that I need to add that between here, so I can click on the little plus. No, that's made it even worse. OK, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going on with that. Oh, I still need to delete the old keyframe. Yeah, OK, I, was, I had uh, too many keyframes. So because I was replacing another another one, I just had to delete it. Yeah, there we go. So as you can see, it's no longer going to be going through the floor. That was way unnecessarily complicated than it needed to be. So now when I push uh, play, that should hopefully go down nice and low to the floor. Zoom up through there. And then it's even going to automatically rotate my camera view around for me. Obviously, it's quite jumpy at the moment because we've not rendered it out. It's just doing a quick real time preview. Um, I could adjust my overall duration. So at the minute it's 14 seconds long. I could set this to be 20 seconds long. And you see the number of keyframes hasn't changed, but it's now going to be much smoother that movement when I render it out because uh, essentially it's going to be adding in more frames per second. There's more seconds overall. And it's still going to be uh, dividing these um, keyframes essentially over like a ratio over that 20 seconds. So it kind of makes sense. Uh, once you're happy with it, you could just click on export. Again, it will ask you to uh, determine um, what settings you're going to be using. I'm doing a 20 second animation here. So that's going to be 30 frames per second or 30 still renders per second for 20 seconds. So 30 times 20, that's how long that's going to take uh, to render. So however long a st uh, still render takes, work out 30 by 20 times that by the duration of a single render, that's how long this would take to render out. But as you can see, for a 20 second animation, you know, I've just hit export. That's rendering out pretty quick already. So 15 seconds, 15% uh, even. In fact, yeah, you know what? I'm going to let this fully render out. I'm tempted to render render that out at 60 frames per second now, just just because you do get that smoother movement. I didn't realize it was going to be this fast. You could, of course, do it to 4K resolution as well if you wanted to, if you're displaying it on a 4K TV. Yeah, it's already done 50%. That's that's pretty impressive. We'll, we'll look at the finished thing together in a sec as well. So it's still rendering out at the moment. 75%. <clears throat> I'm so impressed that this is rendering a 20 second video clip at 30 frames per second this fast. That's really impressive. So obviously really jumpy here because it's still rendering out each image. That's rendered out, which means I can now double click on my Enscape video. Annoyingly, it's just opened in another window. But look how nice and smooth that is now. That's much, much nicer. And of course, I've got this Enscape trial version thing in the bottom right because I don't have my license attached yet. You wouldn't have that on your one uh, as a student. I believe it. I, I don't think it's watermarked. You know, it's super nice, smooth motion, and that took no time to render out at all. It's pretty fantastic stuff. I'm just going to play that one through again. I just want to have another look at it. You know, look at the way it's calculating things like the light and shadow and stuff. It's it's pretty fantastic stuff. There you go. That's how you produce a fly through animation. I would say to be really careful with that. So, for instance, um, what one thing that I do tend to see quite a lot when people are setting up fly through animations is they'll set up their keyframes and they'll add too many of them. So, for instance, if I just set up a different one, um, in fact, how do you set up more than one? Let me just delete all of these keyframes just for a second. Uh, 
I'm just going to go through and clear what we've done so far. Just going to take a second. You can set up multiple videos, but I'll just, I'm just being a bit lazy with it. Just want to make sure nothing's going to affect it. There we go. All right, so nothing's set up at the minute, right? There's no, in fact, there is still one more camera in the scene. Delete that one, and we probably might still have the end one as well. No, we don't. Yeah, so one thing that you'll see quite often with people is they'll set up a view, let's say like that, and they'll start a keyframe, then they'll move a tiny bit. Ah, oh, damn, I did still have another one over there, sorry. There we go. Get rid of that camera as well. Right, there we go. So just coming back to that. So one thing that you will see quite often is people will set up their first keyframe and then they'll walk forward just a little bit and then they'll say, right, I want my camera to look up there and they'll click the next keyframe. And then they'll walk along a little bit and say, actually, I want to look down there. Now, doing stuff like this is generally considered bad because you don't want keyframes to be super close together, at least not if you want smooth motion. Because what you'll end up happening is you have a camera path that looks something like this. And if I go to the beginning of this and push play. Firstly, it's really slow, so I need to change that duration. I don't know why that changed to two minutes. But let's just change it down to like 20 seconds. If I push play. You see the camera looks kind of really juddery. It will look up there, it will look around. Maybe that is the effect that you wanted to go for, but it just gives people nausea looking at it. You know, it's not very nice to kind of look at an experience. Obviously, that's still uh, doing like a pre-render, so that's why it's jumpy anyway. But I think having your resolution, not resolution, having your duration set too low and having your cameras too close together, they're the two common problems you'll get. It's why things kind of look a bit motion sicknessy. So there you go. But yeah, I think that's pretty much all you need to know um, about the video exports. Uh, I'd say you have probably a lot more success if you just render them out as shorter videos, like smoother motion. So rather than adding in too many keyframes, I'm just going to go back and delete these again. Rather than adding too many keyframes, try doing just two. And what you'll probably find is that two is more than enough. So for instance, let's say Let's say I wanted to do a panning shot across this. You know, I could set up my composition so it's nice and straight like that. In fact, on this one, I could do a two point perspective. Yep, so it's on two point. Yeah, so I could go to the left side, for instance. I could set up a keyframe. I could then go to the right side, keyframe. I can set my duration to be like, I don't know, five seconds. And when I push play, that should now pan from left to right. Obviously, I don't want to set this as uh, five seconds in the end. I'd probably want this something more like 20 seconds just to get that smoother movement. So go back to the beginning, push play. And now I get this really nice smooth movement across the scene. Obviously, it's jumpy in the preview because we've not rendered it out yet. It's just a preview. But the final one would give us really nice smooth movement. So I'd render that out as a single image. I would then maybe have another animation where I'm zooming into something, another one where I'm zooming out of something. And then I would put these together in something like Premiere Pro. So try not to render everything in one go. Use it to its strengths um, and kind of play with it from there. That's what I would suggest. You can also do things like uh, focal points and depth of field uh, effects with this. Again, we've already gone through things like depth of field, being able to add like that bokeh and blurriness to the background. So you can play around with the same settings for those just here, essentially. So you could um, do like an animation where focus changes. Now, I am aware of time and we still need to quickly look at materials before we call it a day. Um, but I think what I'll do for this one, I'm going to get these side by side. There's still a couple of windows we haven't looked at just yet. So what I've done, because I'm on Windows, I can just drag drag the window to the left there like that. 
get both of these open. Um, and what we'll do, so let me just open another tab. There we go. I think what we'll do, let's come off of the video mode. I don't want to play with video anymore. Yeah, one thing we can do is we can actually synchronize Enscape to your software. So as you see, obviously I'm using Rhino, but this will work for all, all other programs. If I click on this synchronize button in this toolbar just here, that's going to frame whatever I have going on in Rhino. So for instance, I could rotate around in Rhino. My Enscape is going to update to the same kind of view. And likewise, if I want to zoom into something, I could use the keyboard shortcuts I'm already familiar with to navigate around. So that can be really, really useful. That's kind of really cool. Um, so that's just something I wanted to mention that's really good. Uh, the reason I find that useful as well is because of when we're adding materials, it's really important to be able to zoom in uh, and kind of just, you know, be able to modify your object. So for instance, I'm going to zoom into this desk thing over here. I know that in Rhino, I can select an object and type ZSA for zoom selected all. Um, if you're in SketchUp, you can do zoom selected. If you're in something like Revit, you just kind of need to zoom in a lot. So again, you know, the way you go about it might be slightly different. But essentially, if you wanted to add your own materials uh, to your Enscape scene, let's say you're starting a scene from scratch and everything is just like the default white material at the minute, you'll probably want to be using the Enscape materials. So there is a button that says import predefined materials. Again, you'll find it within the main Enscape toolbar. So not within the Enscape window over here, but within your software that you're going to be using with Enscape. So it's this little orange, orange and black button, import predefined materials. So this is Enscape's material library, and essentially it's web-based. If I wanted to um, add in, I don't know, maybe this worn brick, for instance, it's super easy to do. I'll just click on that brick, click on import selection, and it will download that material and it will move it into your scene. So for instance, it's not applied it to the object because I haven't told it to. Um, but in Rhino, if, if I usually apply materials by going to the materials tab, why can't I click the materials tab? I might need to close that window first. Yeah, um, I might need to click on the materials tab first. If I scroll to the bottom, I will then find that brick 08 worn material there. Enscape materials won't preview well in uh, Rhino and SketchUp, but when you put them onto the object, they will appear correct, which is why we have this other window open. So essentially, the way to do it is to um, have your materials panel, panel open in your software, like in Rhino or SketchUp. So I've got my materials open here on the right. I would then make sure I synchronize my two views between uh, the software and Enscape and have them side by side like this. And then all I need to do is select my object and apply the material to that object. And you see it now appears directly in Enscape. And it's using an Enscape material to do this, which is really, really nice. Now you can modify these further if you wanted to. So there is a button here, this checkered one that says tune materials in the project. So I could click on this one and that's loaded this up. And yet again, this is another frustrating thing with Enscape. There's no preview for that material. So I can't see uh, an image of what material I'm editing. I have to work by the material name. So again, pretty frustrating. But if you're in a software again like uh, Rhino, you can click on an object. Oh, I need to close that window first. You can click on an object. So for instance, uh, this thing that we're modifying, and you'll see that it will tell you what material was selected. So as I click on this, it's that brick number eight worn. So I could then just open the material panel here, brick number eight worn, and then I could go around and uh, modify things. So it's not the nicest way to work in terms of adding materials. Um, I think it's the downside of Enscape. I think it's something they still need to uh, improve upon a bit. But you do get full control over this. So for instance, um, I can adjust the height map. I can adjust how kind of textury uh, these materials are. I can adjust their metallicness. I could tell them to be really shiny and glossy. I could tell them to become transparent. 
Uh, there's a lot of things I can do with this. Uh, and in fact, you can even do some weird stuff with this. If I if I zoom in down here a little bit. Let's zoom in down here. There we go. Yeah, I could even change the material type. So for instance, I could tell it to become a carpet and you see it's gone kind of fluffy on the top. I could tell it to become a clear coat like what you'd have on a car. Um, I could tell it to become grass and you see again it goes fluffy like grass. I could tell it to become water. And you get the idea what this is doing. But at the moment, this water doesn't look very water like because the scale isn't set correctly. So what I would probably do is just increase the scale. I'm going to put that up to 100. And you see now it's looking a little bit better. Still not particularly great. I'm going to increase the waves on this. Yeah, it's starting to look a little bit more watery. I'm going to override those wind settings. Let's make this really windy. Yeah, there we go. It's starting to look a little bit more like it. That looks a bit more like water to me. Again, it's something that you can just kind of play with a little bit. Um, you can also adjust the wind itself. So for instance, I can increase the intensity of the wind. I could change the angle of the wind. So now it's actually going to be able to move that around, which is kind of cool. So again, there are these things that you can play with. You can animate materials themselves. I just wanted to quickly mention those. Oh, and the other thing as well, of course, is if you're doing uh, glowing objects, like uh, for instance, if you wanted to uh, create these glowing lights at the top, you know, you could do that just with a simple white material. You know, just apply it to your object and tell the type to become self illuminated. In fact, if I do it to this bench, maybe I don't want this to be uh, water anymore. Maybe I'm going to change, change that and be self illuminated. So currently it's not illuminated very much. The reason being is that it's black and you can't illuminate black. If I tell this to illuminate, for instance, this pink, you see it now glows. So it now becomes this emissive material. And again, you know, I can change the color to anything I like and, and it will update with it. Um, in fact, that's horrible. Let's put it back to pink. I think the pink was kind of cool. And it's going to affect the lighting of the people around it as well, or the objects around it. So having these emissive materials, very, very good way to add light into your models, especially on interiors. Uh, you can adjust the intensity of these here. Uh, you see um, the level of brightness is set by CD slash M squared, otherwise known as Candela. So you could look up a Candela chart if you wanted to, or you can hover over this little bit there and it will tell you roughly the brightness of things. So like an LCD monitor is around 200 Candela, uh, a cloudy sky is around 2000, and a fluorescent lamp, lamp is around 10,000. So it gives you an idea of what uh, kind of brightness you should be aiming for. I think I think that's about it. Um, oh, there's one more thing. Of course, there's one more thing. Um, I said to you earlier about rendering out that uh, panorama that we did. Uh, obviously, we've still not found where that went to. Um, you want to click on this little cloud where it says view and manage your uploaded panoramas. So what this is going to do, uh, it's going to firstly allow you to see your panoramas. So I could click on that. So it's navigated to my panorama, which looks pretty good. And what I could do, I could choose to save that panorama as a file. That would save it out as like a JPEG or a PNG. Um, I'll show you what that looks like. It looks like this. <clears throat> so obviously it's got this Enscape branding across it because I'm on trial. Uh, but essentially it creates this spherical image. Now, what's cool with this is I can take this spherical image and I can tell that to be pushed to the cloud. So instead of downloading it, um, I can click on the dots, open it in a web browser. So I'm just going to bring that web browser down here. There we go. I can open it in a web browser and now I can share this link with anyone and they can click and drag to orbit around my view. And anyone who's been on uh, right move recently, you know, you might be familiar with these types of things where you can click to the next place, orbit around and so on and so forth to navigate. It's a nice way to add interactivity to your models and to share things with people. 
Um, I think that's about it. The only thing we didn't look at was the web standalones. Um, <clears throat> so you can create what's called a web standalone, or you can export just a regular standalone. Um, it's not batch rendering. Ah, oh, it's this one. So you can uh, export an EXE standalone. And what I'm going to do, let's just say I've clicked on export EXE standalone. I am just going to cancel all of this for now. Um, <clears throat> where is it? Ah, oh, it's this one. No, it's not that one. It's this one. So this one's exported as a standalone. This was a test I did before. And what this allows you to do is it exports your entire scene as a kind of interactive Enscape model that you can send to people. And the great thing with this is people don't need to have Enscape installed. Because it's a standalone, they can just open this and go straight away to navigating it. And it will come up with a series of controls and they can play around. So they can walk around your model. Um, you know, you got the same or similar basic kind of controls down the bottom. You can navigate between your saved views that you've uh, saved previously. You can toggle between uh, your different perspectives and orthographic. You can choose to fly or not fly. Um, and you can even adjust things like your uh, you know, level of detail, like your rendering detail, your level of brightness and things like that. Even things like uh, time of day are still possible to change in this, even without the software itself being installed. So for instance, if I hold shift and do right mouse button, again, you see I can still change the time of day there, which is pretty fantastic stuff. But one thing to mention with this is the controls themselves by default, are absolutely horrible. So as I'm walking around through the space, it's almost kind of drifting. There's something that I can't explain through a screen, but it's something you'd have to play around with to feel. And in fact, if I open the mini map, um, if I let go now, you see it continues to travel. So I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to let go now. And you see it continues to move. So it's that kind of soft selection I was telling you about earlier. So again, if I go to input, I can see movements moving is set all the way up to high on seven. If I drag that down to like two or something similar, as I move around now, I can let go now and it would just stop. So some people prefer it that way. But yeah, I think that's about it. Um, and we're just under two hours, which is pretty spot on. I think that's just about everything you need to know for um, Enscape. Uh, the only thing I would say, of course, is if you're adding in things like interior lighting, you know that you could do it uh, either by adding light materials, those emissive materials that we looked at, or you can just use your default lights. So default SketchUp lights, default Rhino lights, default Revit lights, they will all work directly in uh, Enscape. You just control it under artificial lights in the settings. That's all. Right. Um, do either of you have any questions for me before I disappear? Or are you happy for me to call it a day? Quite a lot of stuff to take in. <laughs> No, cool. If there's no questions, then I think we'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I do appreciate it. <laughs> it's really nice that you guys turned up, so thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure why no one else arrived. But yeah, hopefully you found it useful. <laughs>